And hello everyone. So my name is Kelly McBride. I am from Edinburgh, Scotland. And I'm going to tell you the story about Scotland's Climate Assembly today, touching on a few key features that have been asked to highlight in this presentation. Um, so a few things about Scotland to get us started. Uh, so population around 5.4 million people. Um, Scotland is currently in a governance arrangement where um, by the, uh, some powers are devolved to it by the UK Parliament, so it's able to make policy in particular areas, and some powers are still reserved by the UK Parliament. And I'm going to touch on that at the end of the presentation and what that meant for some of the recommendations from the Climate Assembly. Um, so there's a map of Scotland just there, and as you might be able to tell, um, it includes uh, well, quite a wide geography that includes some islands, uh, which are quite distant from essentially the central belt, which is just down there and has the majority of Scotland's population. Um, but this assembly brought together people from across Scotland. Uh, and you can see there, climateassembly.scot is the website if anyone wants to go and kind of see the record of the process that, take, that took place there. So just to give a bit of context to this to get us going, this was the second National Assembly that took place in Scotland between 2020 and 2022. The first, as Eve just said, was on the future of Scotland, and this was Scotland's Climate Assembly. Um, the entire process was actually delivered online because the key delivery dates happened during the pandemic, so we didn't have a choice in doing that at all. My role in the Assembly at the time, I was working with an organisation called Democratic Society, who partnered with an organisation called Evolve, the UK's participation charity, as part of the design and facilitation team. So I was the co-lead designer and facilitator of the process, working very closely with the secretariat that had been put together um, to lead the process from an administrative perspective. So some context about where this process came from to begin with. It was actually enshrined in legislation in the Climate Change Scotland Act 2019, which conferred some functions for the Citizens' Assembly to consider a few things, including how to prevent or minimise or remedy or mitigate the effects of climate change, make recommendations on measures, and make recommendations about such other matters in relation to climate change for Scottish ministers. So rooted in legislation, reporting to the Scottish Parliament, really important to know that as its root. What it did was it brought together 105 participants who were selected from across Scotland. 20,000 invitations were sent out by an organisation called Sortition Foundation to randomly selected households. That uh, group of people met for seven weekends between November 2020 and February 2022, although it actually reported in June 2021 and that eighth meeting was bringing all the participants back together to reflect on the government response, which was a really important step that we wanted to add to this process that hadn't been a feature um, in other processes in Scotland before. It was delivered entirely online and in this presentation I'm going to lightly touch on what that, what that meant and what the design looked like. Um, and the process, uh, I think it's really important to say up front, did have quite a significant budget of around £1.4 million, if that means anything to you. And it did have um, dedicated resourcing in the form of a secretariat, which was a team of people uh, that came together to do a lot of the operational and logistics side of things, working very closely with uh, myself and colleagues who were on the design and facilitation team and some of the different governance groups and arrangements connected to this as well. Um, and we got involved by essentially uh, applying for a contract, which was put out via the Scottish government procurement systems. Um, so of those 105 people that were involved, uh, they were selected against different criteria. There were eight of them. That included age, gender, geography, household income, ethnicity, rurality, because we really wanted to make sure that the voice of rural Scotland was included in this. It's a sizable part of our population. Disability and also attitudes towards climate change. I won't dwell on this too much, but there is quite a detailed section on the report if you're interested in the recruitment aspect. So what I am going to really focus on is a little bit about the design and deliberation, relatively brief. We could talk about that for the whole presentation in itself. Um, but I wanted to draw out one feature that I found particularly interesting in working on this process, having worked in other assemblies too, um, which was how we tried to build in storytelling and narrative and scenarios. I then want to talk a little bit about working in the open and what that meant for this process touch on media and engagement, and then finally end on talking about some of the outputs and what happened next. So, design and deliberation. The question, it was this, I know it's up on the wall, you might have seen it, but it was how should Scotland change to tackle the climate emergency in an effective and fair way? And that question was set via a workshop that brought together members of um, the stewarding group put together of this, for this process that included representatives from civil society, academia, business and key organisations that had a, a stake in this process. 
Um, and we went through a, a design workshop that essentially looked at some of the key challenges around climate change before trying to narrow down and come up with a question that that group of people thought really got to the heart of what we wanted to, to discuss. And you can probably tell it's a very broad question, but something that everyone really wanted to include on it was considerations of fairness. And that stemmed from conversations around things like just transition, which was at the forefront of some folks' minds. So the word fair is in there very purposefully, and it's something that the members discussed and considered and drew up a short list of what their considerations for fairness could be that they would refer to throughout the process too. Um, in terms of developing the evidence, there was actually a, an online public dialogue that happened in October 2020. And from that dialogue, it happened online, uh, a series of emergent themes were drawn together and published in November 2020. And they became essentially the basis and the guide for the organization of evidence and selection of experts for the assembly. Um, I think just under 500 people or so took part in that process online. Um, but what that resulted in is a design that you could see here, which brings together um, aspects of what became the learning journey, starting with an introduction to climate change, adaptation and mitigation, uh, some information about why we set targets, where Scotland's emissions come from, and how we can make fair and effective change happen. And then what happens is those uh, members of the assembly split into three different work streams to explore different uh, aspects of that in more depth. That included on diet, land use and lifestyle, homes and communities and travel and work. Um, and they went through a series of sessions really digging into those topics before they all came back together to share their learning and start developing their collective recommendations. So this journey itself was designed and put together, informed by that pre-engagement, but primarily by an evidence group um, that brought together a range of people that had expertise in some of the different thematic areas here. And uh, another thing that's also um, maybe not reflected in that diagram, but did happen, was that there was a connection with the Children's Parliament as part of this process. So the Children's Parliament in Scotland, it's an amazing organization. It ran a parallel um, climate process involving children. Uh, and there were points at the process where they interacted with the main assembly as well. Um, and their recommendations are actually included and incorporated into the final report from this process too. So we had over 100 expert speakers. It was quite sizable, really, uh, in the end, in that respect. And more than 60 hours of time together, learning and deliberating. There were so many questions that popped up. We tried to be as responsive as possible throughout the whole process to those questions, drawing on those over 100 experts and guided uh, very steadily, I think, by the nine evidence leads that were involved. So uh, this all took place online. Um, as you would expect, it involved a mix of small groups and plenary sessions. We had two lead facilitators, myself and, and someone called Kayla from Evolve, and uh, small group facilitators. All of those speakers that came, they either spoke in the plenaries, but we also used, um, made the use of pre-recorded content quite a lot for this process, which I'll talk about in a moment in a bit more depth as well. Um, and people also joined small groups to engage in conversations, answer questions. And I know that the speakers that joined us online absolutely loved doing that. They had lots of fun. Um, and we used a mix of tools and techniques. I'll touch on that in a second. And I think something that I really appreciated throughout the process was having a research team sitting alongside us as we went. And after each uh, weekend, they produced essentially a briefing of some learning and key reflections from a research perspective that we were able to look at and say, hey, maybe we need to switch this up for next time, or maybe this could be an improvement. And, give that feedback to our facilitation teams. An absolutely crucial part of making this work was the support that we gave to all of those members to participate. And a lot of time and effort was put into this. Um, and particularly some of the team from Involve really were just there all the time to support people to take part. They did things including having one-to-one -one calls with all of the participants. Um, we jointly ran some training sessions, which included introductions to the digital tools we'd be using and trying to build confidence in using tools because Simply, uh, some of the people that participated um, didn't really go online very much. One person self-reported they'd never even been on the internet. Uh, and they all went through the process, which was br brilliant to see at the end. Um, but we had to do things like provide devices, laptops, uh, data, giant keyboards, headphones, whatever people needed to be able to take part in this. And having that dedicated contact and ongoing support throughout, someone people could call or email um, meant a lot, I think, to, to the participants. So I think if you're ever doing this online and it's not something you've done before, absolutely crucial. I think this was a real key to success. And we tried to keep it simple when we worked online. We were trying to be quite thoughtful about the tools we used. We did some light testing with users or people that we thought um, would be using these kind of tools beforehand to make sure that we picked ones that were right. 
Uh, so we all use Zoom. Um, Zoom links were embedded within a microsite that we created, which basically was just a, a site that held all of the information and evidence and agendas that the participants would need. It was a, it was a Google site. Uh, we produced lots of video content. Um, we used Jamboards, Google Jamboards, and we purposely selected them as opposed to things like uh, Mural or Miro boards. Um, people found them a lot easier to use and easier to read some of the text. Uh, we used Google Docs for some collaborative drafting, and there were points where people were drafting entire statements as a collective. Um, SurveyMonkey, actually, we used for some of the voting, using kind of Likert scales and different things like that. And again, the training and support, I just emphasized that too. So one of the features I just wanted to touch on uh, about the design, and as we went through that process, if you remember the flow, was the storytelling aspect. So the assembly used scenarios at some different points and storytelling as tools to consider how change had happened. And the scenarios that were developed, we worked with uh, Forum for the Future uh, to do this, were loosely based on previous work with EU Innovate, if you've heard of that program, with support, uh, as I said, from Forum for the Future. Um, and on the bottom right-hand corner there, it's probably too small to see, you can see the scenarios that were developed. Then what happened is the evidence group um, developed fictional stories for each of the scenarios that were there, exploring what a day in the life of ordinary Scottish citizen might look like were these scenarios to play out. Now, this was not about saying, you know, this is definitely what's going to happen, or these are the options that you have in front of you. It was about digging into some of the possibilities, some of the potential futures, and some of the trade-offs, in particular, I'd highlight the trade-offs point, that would be considered in choosing kind of different routes um, towards the future we were looking at. And people were very encouraged to think about um, levers and barriers to change, and we used this little rainbow diagram, I'd call it throughout, to think about the different levels and levers of which change happens, including through individuals, households, organizations, public policy, and society norms, values, and beliefs. Um, and that was there as kind of a, a prompt throughout. But we built in time for people to have lots of discussions, essentially thinking about, you know, what do you want the day in the life of you and your family to look like in the future? What are some of the different ways that we could possibly live? And um, Forum for the Future came and did a, an amazing presentation talking about change, which was actually based on the story of rock and roll. So we were trying to find ways to engage in people uh, and think about futures and scenarios and storytelling in different and engaging ways that weren't always directly uh, related to climate, but had a key message that was. And it was really effective, actually. I, I think it really helped people to imagine this stuff in a different way. Um, and as we got to the final weekend, uh, the recommendations and goals on the ballot were actually presented back to members in a final story, which visualized the interconnectivity of their ideas. And there is a video um, that basically tells this story. So again, we were trying to use quite engaging media to be able to reflect back to people that what their recommendations would actually look like were they to be implemented in a slightly different way. Okay, working in the open, just taking time, good. Um, so yeah, I've already mentioned Scotland's Climate Assembly meeting the Children's Parliament, and like it, oh, it was just such a joy to do. So I don't know, if you are ever thinking about youth engagement processes or connection with children, it can absolutely work, and I think this is a huge success, not least because of the amazing expertise of the, the staff at the Children's Parliament. But um, the, the Assembly did actually consider what the children said, and I know did change at least one of their recommendations to ensure that they incorporated the views of the children um, in doing so, so yeah, really worthwhile. Something we felt was quite important, all of us, was the transparency and openness of the process. Um, so there was an observer program put together by the Secretariat, which basically meant that you could sign up and receive a link to all of the information and evidence that was shared during the assembly sessions. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and you could also join a, a live session. So after every weekend, we basically had a one and a half, two hour slot where observers could come along. They could meet the facilitation team, the secretariat and others involved, and they could find out what happened in the session and ask questions too. So yeah, that, that observer program was absolutely possible online. And I think really important to do. We didn't um, have observers in the room. I know there's some debate about whether or not you should include observers kind of in the plenary space in the small groups, but we felt that wasn't uh, appropriate in this, in this instance. So we set this up. And then all of those videos, all of that evidence, it is still online. Uh, it's on a YouTube account, to be honest, uh, for Scotland's Climate Assembly. And I think a lot of this content personally is reusable. And I do know that some people that have had climate conversations in other settings in Scotland have looked at this content. So I think having reusable content uh, is a really wonderful thing. And to be honest, I think it's probably the highest quality uh, content that I've ever been able to use 
in an assembly process. I take no credit for it. I didn't make a single video. I'm in a few of them, but I didn't make any. Um, but yeah, it was really, really worth doing. And then I think just having that long-term record of the process is something I really value too. So yeah, just thinking about the reuse of materials, trying not to repeat the effort, I think is so important because these things do take a lot of work. Media and engagement. Um, so yeah, I want to touch on this briefly. So I know that connecting with the media, getting the press to come to these events, giving it the coverage that we sometimes want and sometimes these processes deserve is really difficult. We're jostling for position with lots of news stories. I think uh, participatory and deliberative democracy isn't always necessarily understood uh, by all people in the media at the moment. So um, what this process did is ensure that it had a dedicated and experienced staff member hired to the secretariat. And that person, uh, and I think this is credit to the individual, uh, Elliot, was that um, he had worked on the previous assembly and had knowledge of how a citizens assembly or mini public process works. And I think that's really crucial because being to go able to go out to speak to the media, to speak to stakeholders and explain exactly what an assembly is, uh, is really, really important. And yeah, that, that was brilliant. Um, but the approach that was put together for the strategy for media included a mix of different formats. So looking to reach out to national and local print media, national and local broadcasts, social media, uh, a mix of podcasts, and also taking part in events. And after the process, linking up with things like COP26, which was a brilliant opportunity. So doing some mapping, I think, of initiatives and, and launches and events that are happening in your place you can connect with is really, really um, recommended. Alongside that, there was also a series of engagement around um, ministerial meetings, so making sure that there were continuous meetings with ministers, they were kept up to date with the process and being briefed. Public events where members of the public could come along to learn a bit more about the process, in some cases hearing directly from members. Sector engagement, so of course, uh, when you're talking about climate, there are just so many actors and stakeholders involved, so finding opportunities to connect with them and bring people along the journey, which is really at the heart of all of this, uh, was really important as well as events that took place in Parliament, including um, continued engagement of elected members and keeping political representatives up to date on plans too. And then, yeah, national and local press coverage. There was quite a lot uh, in the end, I think, probably more than I, I saw for the first Citizens' Assembly in Scotland, for sure. So hopefully that momentum and understanding is building. But um, I, my favourite article, unsurprisingly, was probably the publication of the joint uh, statement of ambition that the Climate Assembly had drafted together which was published in our national press um, and simply set out, as you can see there in quote, just the, the words of the assembly itself. And yeah, being able to, to get that into the media was a, was a big deal um, and I was very happy to see it. Uh, we do keep, we have kept a record on the website of the Secretariat have of all the, the publications and the press and the media. So that record does live if anyone wants to look at the website to take a look. But uh, yeah, it was definitely an improvement on previous processes. But I think that's a combination of just the expertise and skill and understanding of the process of the people involved, the hard work and just the good strategy that they put together. And at the heart of another aspect of that was really the participant voice and sharing stories. So I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the report, but you might notice in there that we've just filled it with quotes from members of the process, because I think there's nothing better than hearing their reflections in their own words. But members um, have continued to be engaged. Uh, unfortunately, the secretariat of the process are, are no longer in place. Um, but people are still really interested in the story of the assembly and some members have kept connected and connected with one another. Um, they're going out there, speaking at events and continuing to share the stories, not least on the reflections of the impact that it's had on their life since and some of the <coughs> different changes that they've made too. So outputs and what happens next in the last few minutes. Um, so there was an interim report and then there was a final report that has been published. Um, and after the publication of that report, a few different things happened. First of all, um, Scotland's Civic Charter on Climate was kicked off. So essentially, this was a public statement that was put together. And then over 100 um, individuals and organisations across Scottish society signed up to that. Uh, quite big organisations, you know, people that had quite a bit of profile. And what that attempted to do was really highlight the support that there was behind the recommendations. So getting a bit more kind of you know, wider support than just the assembly itself. And that was addressed to the Scottish government, the Scottish parliament, and more broadly to Scottish society too, because this is also about bringing everyone on the journey. Um, and then uh, there was a response, of course, published by the Scottish government as was expected. That was um, 
shared with all the assembly members in an event uh, where they basically co-drafted a response that you can see here to what they thought about that, uh, that report from the government. So they had an opportunity to basically consider that response, discuss it, and see whether or not they thought that it was acceptable at this point in time uh, and what they might want the government to further reflect on. And I think it's quite a strong statement from the members. It essentially does say, you know, government, we actually do want you to go further. Um, but acknowledging that also a lot of the changes there are longer term uh, and may take a wee while to see kind of the fruits of. But I think, again, just reflecting on, on this bit, I think it's really important to find opportunities to bring people back together after a process has concluded and not consider that final event when you've made your recommendations as the end. Um, so, yeah, I'm certainly building that into everything I, I do now, and lots, <coughs> lots of other people are too. Um, and there was also a recommendation, uh, sorry, a, a research report that sat alongside this as well. And Scotland's, I think, invested quite a bit in trying to research these processes to draw on some learning for, for running things in future. So both this uh, process and the Citizens' Assembly that happened before do have research reports connected to them as well. Um, and then nearly at the end, just to reflect on this. So um, I mentioned at the start that Scotland has some devolved powers and it has some reserved powers. Some of the recommendations that came out from the Climate Assembly are things that it's not currently within the full competency of the Scottish Government to address. So um, a, a letter from the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport was basically sent to the UK Government um, to their Minister for Business, Energy and Clean Growth just highlighting some of the areas where currently Scottish government can't make the change, but encouraging and asking the UK government to take some action. And you can see there uh, that includes, but it's not limited to, things like fiscal and pricing elements of emissions trading, decisions on things like energy in the gas grid, investment in uh, electricity network infrastructure, regulation, vehicle standards, motoring taxes, um, and then I think crucially the regulation of renewable energy investment in Scotland. So, yeah, it's really interesting just, I think, thinking about the governance and I certainly reflecting on other processes, particularly at the local level that I've been involved with. You get a lot that comes out around um, powers that are held really by central government and, you know, thinking through with councils and municipalities how to respond to that is always interesting. So to conclude, um, the process in the end developed that collective statement that you saw published in the press alongside 16 key goals, which had 81 connected recommendations. Um, Initiatives have started to emerge from the process. I think there's a lot of work still to be done. You know, there's new initiatives that are going to spring up over the next few years. There's a lot of longer term ambition in this. So I think we still, like any assembly, are waiting to see the full extent of the impact. But we have seen some quick action on a few small things. Um, I think that it has demonstrated that a full assembly process can be successfully delivered online, including people that have reported uh, low confidence right at the start of that process if you set up your support in the right way. I think the creation of open and reusable content uh, is helpful and it also sets some standards for transparency and individual impact. I mean, you can measure it in lots of different ways, but working online in this way, we still saw that the connections, the learning, the development of new skills, and at the end, the self-reported changes in perspective and behavior as a result of the uh, participation. And yeah, some people are still involved, which is good. I think that's it. Cool, thank you.